How should the name of God be pronounced? The holy name, the full name, the full lettered name in the Bible, Yud Hey Vav Hey. That is how it is transliterated. And it is given, it is you will find in encyclopedic articles on Wikipedia and so on that this name uh, was rendered in English as Jehovah, or in modern uh, terminology sometimes it is given as Yahweh. And these uh, renditions of the name is not are not correct. This is not how the name was was pronounced. The name was pronounced differently. And this is what we are about to discuss. How was the name pronounced, if we know how the name was pronounced? And why was the pronunciation of the name hidden? And why is it still hidden? And uh, is there any chance of anyone knowing at present how it should be uttered? And this is what we are about to uh, talk about. And uh, my name is Yair Dabidi. I live in Jerusalem. I am the director of Brit Am Hebrew Nations and our organization researches the whereabouts of the Lost Ten Tribes. We look to see where the Lost Ten Tribes went to and we find them amongst Western peoples. That is what we do with the West. We, we, we research. We research where the Lost Ten Tribes went to. We find them amongst Western peoples. Research. After research, we have the, the um, aspect of revelation, of bringing to the, to the recognition of the public, to the awareness of the public, the, the truth that our research has unveiled as to where the Western jobs were and that they are amongst Western peoples. And uh, in addition to that, we also have the ocean reconciling. Judah, this is the Jewish people with the ten tribes of Israel. And usually we avoid, we avoid um, religious uh, theological uh, subjects. We avoid, avoid, we are wary of discussing these matters because we don't want to get sidestepped. We don't want to um, be led into uh, fields that, uh, that we may not get out of or that will take up time and energy and, uh, and divert our resources and uh, the focus of our efforts from where we want them to go. And we also do not want to alienate people who uh, otherwise might be open to uh, receive our message concerning the Lost in Tribes. So, uh, in this case, we are making an exception because, uh, first of all, people are writing to us, asking us questions about us, sending us information or sending us their viewpoints, and we uh, feel that the, the subject should be uh, dealt with. We, at least we should make our own appreciation of what is going on uh, clear, and also because of this idea of the lost uh, name or the use of the, of the name is being used, it's being exploited or misappropriated by people who are anti-Jewish. They are against the Jewish people and they're against uh, the rabbis and they're against people like myself and uh, they are quite underhand and uh, dishonest in their approach and they use the subjects like the present one to uh, to attack us or to undermine any sympathy that might exist for us and therefore we feel that the, the, the matter should be dealt with. In addition to that, the truth, the truth, truth should come out. The truth should be made known. The truth is quite obvious and for some reason uh, you don't find it. You look up on the, on the web, you make a web search of it, and you will not find the simple, straightforward answer to these questions. And the, the answer is straightforward and is simple. And the answer that we are about to give you is, uh, is, quite, easily to, to, uh, is quite easily verified. Anyone who is interested, don't take our word for it. If you are, what we say sounds interesting, it sounds feasible, it, sa it says something to you, it sounds probable, it sounds like the truth but you're not certain, check it out, ask other authorities, uh, go to other other people, uh, rabbis or religious writers who are authoritative on the matter and you may uh, clarify the matter for yourself and we encourage you to do so. So this is what we're talking, we're about talking about the, the name, the name of God. The name of God in the Hebrew Bible, the name of God is four letters, roughly equivalent to uh, YH, VH, but even the letters are not certain. Maybe the, instead of Y, it should be I. Instead of V, it should be W. But they, these letters are similar. Uh, the name uh, in the past was pronounced, and the, uh, the present is not. Where it occurs in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, where this name is found in the Hebrew Bible, in manuscripts of the uh, Torah scrolls of the Hebrew Bible, and so on. Uh, and, and then translated into English. The English translations usually render the word as Lord, 
sometimes they render it as God or Almighty, depending on the context, depending on certain uh, general principles that apply in the translations of, of this name when it appears. And uh, someone sent us a YouTube clip about the holy name of the Mount of the Almighty, about this name. They said the rabbis, that is the sages or the Pharisees, whatever they want to call them, had been keeping this a secret for hundreds of years. That's what they said, though, those rabbis, those mischievous rabbis had been uh, hiding this secret away. They had been stealing the identity of the Almighty for their own purposes for some reason or other. That is what they said. Believe it or not, and this is just a, this is coming from a source that should be uh, sympathetic towards the Jewish people, because one of the people speaking uh, defines himself as Jewish, but it doesn't really matter. This is the way it goes. This is the way what people say, and uh, it is not true. It is simply not true. The, in this uh, clip, the person speaking also offered his own version of how the name should be pronounced, and it also is not correct. Um, he apparently was uh, mistaken or misleading or both. And he does not know how to say the holy name. No one knows how to say the holy name. Uh, and it is uh, against the explicit words of the Bible to, tr to, to um, try and say this name in our time. And uh, this is not the first time that this issue has come up before us. And uh, it has to be dealt with and we are dealing with it at present. And... This is uh, what we should uh, speak about. We find an incident in the Bible in Leviticus 24 when the name was used and the person using it used it in the wrong way and he was put to death because of it. Leviticus 24 verse 10, beginning from verse 10, it tells us, Now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian man, went out among the children of Israel, and this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp, and the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, and so they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shlalamit, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take outside the camp him who has cursed they ended all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The stranger as well as him who was born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. A little further down then, uh, verse 23, uh, Leviticus 24, verse uh, 23, it says, And Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and they took him outside the camp, him who had cursed, and stoned him with stones. So the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. See, from the passage that someone who cursed another person using the name of God, this explicit name of God, this four-lettered name of God, the Tritragamatan, as it is called in technical terms, Anyone who uses this name when cursing, uh, wishing evil or bad upon someone else, even if the, the person he was cursing um, may have been, uh, had done him wrong. Maybe the cursing from an objective point of view was justified. Nevertheless, the fact that he used the name in cursing caused him to incur the, to, the death penalty and he was put to death and he could be put to death and this became the law, a standing law. In Israel, anyone who used this name in cursing another person could be put to death. If you curse someone but didn't use the name, then nothing would happen. You might have to pay a fine. Also today, if you curse someone, you might have to pay a fine. But apart from that, no serious penalty would come upon you. But if you use the name, the holy name, in cursing, you will be put to death. Because this name has power and using this name is a serious matter. And uh, nowadays we do not have the death penalty for religious offences. There's no Sanhedrin, there's no courts. The uh, conditions are not amenable. They do not lead themsel lend themselves to this. But nevertheless, according to tradition, um, the penalty is still there in the eyes of heaven. That is to say, if, God forbid, a person um, be, uh, commits a f an offence for which he should be killed by stoning. Uh, the, incidentally, there were three. The death penalty was uh, administered in three in the three different uh, forms. There was stoning, there was uh, fire or burning. That is having um, not burning 
internal burning uh, and also a decapitation. These were the full forms of the death penalty. And for instance, and if you in, uh, uh, transgressed, uh, committed a transgression for, his, for which you were liable for the death penalty, in, the, in ancient times you would be put to death if, under certain conditions, if there were witnesses and so on, and the courts were uh, so decided. Uh, at present time, you, these uh, penalties are not administered, but uh, in the eyes of heaven, according to tradition, that someone who is liable for these penalties is still uh, liable, it still may happen that he will be punished in such a way. For instance, someone who is liable for the stoning, he might die by falling off a cliff, or a stones might fall on him, a house might fall on, a building might collapse on him, he might die in a car accident, or whatever happens, his death might be similar to that which is incurred by stoning. And this is, this is a liability, this is something which happens. And uh, the, the, these, these matters apply to Jews who are still bound by, to, by the law. They do not apply to non-Jews on the whole. With exceptions, they do not usually apply to non-Jews. Uh, but but uh, cursing using the name you would apply and other things would apply. And, um, and also concerning the members of the descendants of the lost ten tribes of Israel, they're technically speaking not Jewish. They're also, these laws do not apply to them. But uh, the times are changing. It may be come about in a short period of time that these laws might apply once or more to them in some form or other. And even now they should uh, be coming, bring themselves closer to a realization of, of, of the biblical truth, of the biblical uh, psychology and the, the biblical message. So they should be aware of the, these matters. At all events, we do not want people incurring liabilities that they may not be able to cope with. Uh, life is difficult as it is. Life is uh, very, can be very, very difficult, and we, there's no reason why anyone should uh, bring upon himself more than he has to cope with any more adverse effects or, or uh, negative energies. Because should, positive energy is what we should seek for, and we should try and, and eliminate sources of negative energy. It says in Leviticus 19, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, you shall surely rebuke your neighbor, not bear sin again because of him, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore we do not want any, any source of, of punishment, of perdition to exist when it doesn't have to do so. We do not want people incurring penalties they cannot handle. And archaeological evidence shows that this was uh, this was what was happening in ancient times. In ancient times, we had the ten tribes, and ten tribes were in the north. They were conquered by the Assyrians, taken away into exile, uh, into Assyria, and from in Assyria they uh, lost consciousness of their ancestry, and then they were pushed to the north. From the north, they moved to the west, and they became western nations. And uh, they uh, had a task and, a, and the duties of their own to fulfil, and they have fulfilled these tasks historical sense, in the end times they will return and once more become conscious of their ancestry. After the ten tribes were taken into exile, uh, about uh, more than a century later, the, the, uh, the Babylonians, the Babylonians and the Medes uh, conquered the Assyrian Empire and they divided the, the Syrian Empire between them. The Babylonians also attacked Judah, Judah which had remained independent. There had been ten tribes, ten tribes in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south, the kingdom of Judah was sent on, sent it on Jerusalem through the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, maybe, and uh, portions, minority portions of the other tribes. And from the kingdom of Judah, I derived the core section, uh, the central section uh, of, of the Jewish people. And where this kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, and all of its inhabitants were taken into exile to Babylon. Meanwhile. Uh, the Medes, the allies of the Babylonians, were replaced by the Persians. The Persians conquered the Babylonians. Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia, then allowed the Jews to return, and so did uh, Darius and Ahasuerus, the kings who came after after Cyrus, uh, the, the, with the limitations. The, and at all events, under the Persians, the Jews were unable, unable to return. They started coming back in dribs and drabbles, a few at a time or very uh, small groups, but they, these grew over, over a period and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the uh, re-established the Jewish religion and uh, the Jewish entity in the land of Judah.
And meanwhile, the name of God uh, or forms derivations or attempts to re, re, re uh, to utter the name of God had been adopted by neighboring peoples. We find evidence amongst the Egyptians, amongst the Greeks, amongst pagans or quasi-pagan groups, uh, apparently also amongst the Edomites who were using this name. Even the name of the Roman uh, chief god of, Ro of the Romans was called Job. Job was probably pronounced Yova. This is also a similar to a, a possible derivation of the name of the holy name of, of the full letter name of God. Uh, and uh, this shows that this name was being bandied about, cheapened, and also pagan gods were being given this name or was being associated, was being uh, ridiculed, was being brought down. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, the, the, and apparently because of this and because of the seriousness of the matter, it had been decided that this name should be hidden. And uh, what I'm saying, you may look it up, Wikipedia articles on the Tetragrammaton, the names of God in Judaism, they bring, uh, give you background to what we are saying, how the name was misused and also found amongst other nations and other peoples, the different variations of how people thought the name should have been pronounced, but let me warn you that none of these uh, suggestions are correct and the, no one really knew how to pronounce the name, even at that time, they were being deliberately misinformed or misinforming themselves through divine providence and uh, I'll explain, I'll ex this will be explained. The situation whereby pagans and paganized groups were liable to misuse the holy name was forbidden. The Jews were subject to minority and like everyone else they were influenced by their neighbors and uh, so it wasn't enough to, to we could, can't say because other people were misusing this name or people um, or bad elements have been using, misusing this name that the Jews should just continue doing their own thing. Because it was obvious that the Jews had to interact because of their situation with the neighboring peoples and they would too have been influenced by them. Therefore, actions had to be taken. And uh, it says in Exodus 23, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take his name in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take his name in vain. You will not be absolved. You will not be get away clean. By taking this name in vain, by, taking, by, by using this name or misusing this name. And, and therefore the name had to, be, had to be hidden. The Bible had already made allowance for this from the very beginning. It had been foreseen that the use of the holy name would have to be terminated at some stage, at least temporarily. Uh, then, uh, because the usage of the name was liable to get out of hand as it had done. The Bible tells us that the Almighty revealed his name to Moses. See Exodus 3. Exodus 3, beginning from verse 13, it says, Then Moses said to you, God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, that you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Get this last, this last uh, section, this last verse, so, what we just said, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations, because these are key words. This is a key sentence, and we shall return to it. And we, we are or we're told, we are told uh, later in Exodus 6 that the name, the sacred name, will be known to the forefathers. It says in God, Exodus 6, verse 2, 3, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, as God Almighty, and Hebrew El Shaddai, and God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, that is the tetragrammaton, the full lettered name, I was not known to them. And so we see that the holy name was revealed to Moses for the first time. Uh, and uh, in uh, Exodus 3.15, we saw it, but what, uh, when, what does the, word, the verse say, the verse that we read previously, Exodus 3.15, Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. So I repeat this sentence, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. And this expression, this is my name forever, Exodus 3.15, this is my name forever, it says forever. That's how we read it. That's how it's translated in all the translations. But does it really say that? Does it really say forever? If you look at the Hebrew text, it says you have the letters Le Elam. Lamed Ein, Lamed Mem. Le Elam. 
And what does let elam mean? Let elam means to be hidden. That is what let elam means. And why is it translated the olam? Because the rabbis inserted a vowel point. They inserted a vowel point oi that makes it sound like the olam because the two let the olam and let elam are similarly are spelt very similarly. They inserted a vowel point where, they, where according to the previous the simple meaning of the text there was no vowel point. And they changed the meaning of the word. But they said that even though they changed the meaning of the word and therefore we read it as we read it, we read it as if it says forever. And remember, because of this, because of the rabbis, uh, carry on, uh, give us a tradition, you, you open up a Torah scroll and you see letters, you see letters and you see no vowels. And each and every uh, word can be uh, uh, pronounced in different ways, uh, depending on how you insert the vowels. And how, how do we know which word is actually there? Because we have traditions. And who carries on the, the tradition? To me, me who transmits the tradition? It's the rabbis. And if there is a dispute or a doubt about what the word actually says or means, then the rabbis decide. If it was not for the rabbis, we would not be able to read the Bible. Without the rabbis, there is no Bible. Without the Hebrew Bible, there are no valid translations into English. The Bible was written in Hebrew, and the rabbis decide how the Hebrew Bible is to be decided, because they have a tradition and authority leading back to Moses, from the, who wrote the Bible. And it says this in my name, to be hidden in Hebrew. But the rabbis decided that it should be read as it, that it should be read as if it says forever. But but they said that the two meanings should not be um, one meaning should not replace the other. The, 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 the written simple written meaning was also to be applied in, circum, in certain circumstances. And so we have the we have a here we have a we have, you have an option. If you do not accept what the rabbis say, if you do not accept the authority of the rabbis, then you have to take the text as it is written, the simple meaning. The simple meaning says, this is my name, to be hidden. The name had, under certain circumstances, to be hidden, according to the simple meaning. But if you accept what the rabbis, if you want to uh, uh, accept it, or read, the, read it as it is commonly uh, translated, meaning the olam, this is my name, the olam, as the simple as the text says in its translation, and as the rabbis say it should be read, then you are then you are accepting and you are basing yourself on the authority of the rabbis. If you are basing yourself on the authority of the rabbis, you should also accept their their explanation that that the both meanings are applicable. This is my name forever, uh, but and this is my name that will be hidden under certain circumstances in the future. Because that's what the rabbis say. And if you do not accept the rabbis, then it simply says, this is my name to be hidden. At all events, the name had to be hidden, or, or could have been be hidden when the, when the uh, conditions warranted the hiding. We have a Rabbi Yaakov Zubi Let Mecklenburg, a Kitab Kabbalah, a commentary on the Bible, 1839, he wrote it. I, I, uh, I like his commentary, I use it now and again. And he, on Exodus 315, our verse, he says, this is my name forever, or this is my name to be hidden. And this is my memorial to all generations. That's how the verse is translated. And this is my memorial to all generations. The words translated as to all generations, Hebrew, the door, door, also be understood as saying according to each generation. In other words, this is my name forever, but it is to be hidden in certain generations. You know, that is explicit, that is the meaning of the verse. That is what the verse says. This is my name that is to be hidden in certain generations, or according to the generation. Or oh, this is my name forever, as how, and it, it, but nevertheless it is to be hidden. And this is what this is simple meaning of the verse of the Hebrew. How we translate it, how the translation that we use, that is commentary. We are not coming to propose a, a, a convoluted explanation in place of the simple meaning as found in the in the translation. We are saying that the translation is in effect a, a commentary, a convoluted commentary derived indirectly from the simple meaning, and we're just getting back to the simple meaning uh, in its wholeness, in its completeness. And uh, the, in other words, the name was meant to be hidden according to the Bible. When hiding was needed in, in Egypt, from generation to generation, if, if in a certain generation the name needed to be hidden, then it was to be done, it was to be hid. And how was this hiding to take place, you might ask, Harry? It's written down. How can you hide a word and still have it there? So, 
We won't go into the details, but we're in very, we won't go into deep details, but you, we'll give you enough of the uh, a picture of the reality, and uh, there should be a suffice for the present. If you look at a Torah scroll, you only see the letters. As we said, you only see letters. You only see letters, mainly vowels, not vowels, sorry. You do not see most of the vowels. You actually see no vowels. You see consonants and other letters that can may double as consonants or as vowels. Most of the vowels are not there, but even hinted at. So how do we know how where which uh, where the vowels should be according to tradition? And uh, these were actually written down, but they written, when were they written down? When they were first written down? In about uh, 600 uh, CE. Uh, in other words, uh, after. In the common era, uh, 600 CE, in the Dark Ages in Europe, after the end of the Roman Empire, a long, long, very not, a long, long time after the biblical period, not that long ago, that's when they were written down, 600 CE, and uh, also going on even later, almost up until the time of the Crusades, up to about 1000 AD CE, in the common era. And they were written down at a very late date, but all over the world, wherever you have a Jewish community, it is agreed, it is accepted that the, the, the name, that the, the, the Torah scroll should be written, should be read in a certain way, and the vowels should be inserted into each and every letter in a certain way. And why do they do this? Because they accept the authority of the sages who carried on the, tr the tradition from each and every generation, from generation to generation. And every, every single Jewish community all over the world accepts this and there are very, very minor variations between one uh, uh, Torah scroll and the other and these one or two or three uh, variations that in, in hundreds of thousands of letters uh, do not reflect, uh, have no, no, no implications at least at the simple level concerning the meaning of the words concerned. In other words, there is a for practical purposes, complete unanimity, a complete agreement as to how the words should be uttered, and this has relied upon the uh, the rabbinical authority. And without the, the rabbinical authority, this unanimity would not exist. And uh, so, each and every uh, word in the Bible has uh, uh, we have a vowels for it. We know the vowels according to tradition, except, except for the tetragrammaton, and except for the four-lettered word of the holy name of God. There we do not have vowel signs. We do not have vowel signs for this name. Ah, uh, but if you look at it, you look at it, you will see vowel signs. You might say you will see vowel signs, but they, they're not the vowel signs of the letter. They're not the vowel signs of the word. What happens is, the name is written in the Hebrew text. It is written in the Hebrew text, written in the Torah scroll. You have this name written wherever it appears as it, as the Torah scroll is written down, word for word, as it should be. Whenever they, and, uh, and uh, in the Torah scroll itself, there are no vowel signs. In the manuscripts that give us the vowel signs, when they come to this letter for the, 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 the four-lettered name of God, they take the names that we use instead of, of the name. In other words, when um, when uh, you read in the synagogue, when someone reads in the synagogue from the Torah once once a week, on Shabbat uh, they read the whole uh, whole section of the Bible. Also on uh, on uh, Mondays and Thursdays they read uh, short sections of it, uh, and they go through the whole Torah scroll in a year uh, and, uh, according to the present system. And they read uh, whenever they come to the name of God, they use other words. They use other names such as uh, one one name meaning Lord. That's where we get the English uh, custom of putting the word Lord wherever this name is found, a Hebrew word meaning Lord, or they use a, in certain circumstances they use a name meaning God in Hebrew. And uh, these two names, Lord and God, each have their own vowel sign for times. So when you get uh, manuscripts that, got, that gave us the vowel signs for the whole of the Hebrew text, when they came to the name, holy name, the, 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 the four-lettered name, they took the vowel signs from these letters. And therefore, the vowel signs do not belong to the words. And a lot of, uh, of attempts to pronounce the name, such as the recent attempt, we spoke of, attempt that we spoke about, uh, mistakenly take the vowel signs and apply them to the letters, but they're from two different words. They're not, it's not pertinent. And this is how the, 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 the correct pronunciation of the name was hidden. It was hidden in the text in full view. 
And uh, just to show you the comp dot, we shall show you what what we mean by taking an example. Uh, taking an example by um, this is. Uh, Let's take two different words, two different words such as we have um, the, uh, these could not have been the original ones. In other words, when, when you have the uh, four-lettered name in, the, in a manuscript and you have underneath it the vowel signs, the vowel signs have been taken from another word. And therefore you cannot apply the vowel signs to the name of God because these are not the original vowel signs. So let's take a, let's take two different letters, two different words. We chose at random and show how what would happen in English if we did this because what would happen in English is the same thing as would, would happen in, uh, in Hebrew. Let us take the two words been and one. And ones. Been and ones. Been. B-E-E-N. B W E N been I have been you shall have been okay been this word been I have been as in I have been been has got two uh, consonants in it two uh, letters named called consonants B and N it also has a vowel a vowel sound E we have B that and a uh, consonant B E a vowel and N, another consonant. And together we have been, been. Okay. And together we get the word been with the vowel signs, the vowel sign and the consonants. Let's take this other word, ones, ones, O-N-E-S. Uh, from the sentence, the original ones, ones. Ones is pronounced as ones. Ones. It has. Uh, it's written O N E S. It is pronounced W O N S. Ones. Let's take the second word. The second word. Ones. O N E S. Ones is pronounced as as ones. W O O N S. Ones. There's three consonants. W, N, and S. And there's one vowel. O. Wa. O. Ones, ones. Uh, you just remove the vowel from ones, leaving us uh, with uh, three consonants W N S. Now let's put in the place of the of the con of the vowel where we took out a ones. To, let's put in this place a vowel that we found in bean. The e sound. So there we get wings, wings. Instead of ones, we get wings. Uh, and uh, this is a this is the point. And this is a, a minor example because uh, here we're only dealing with one substitution. Whereas in the name of the Almighty, we're we're dealing with uh, four or five substitutions of the vowels. And then we have the combinations of the substitutions, and we also have the, the consonants change, na name changes. And uh, so we get an exponential increase in the variations and the deviations from the original. And therefore, we should be aware, and uh, we should not uh, take the name of God in vain. We should not uh, try and give God a name which is not His. We should also be careful of this, because... Uh, God forbid, it is dangerous. We saw how dangerous it was when a, a, a person was stoned for using the name in the wrong sense, in the wrong way. Do not be misled. Do not take the name of God in vain. Do not attempt to take the name of God in vain. And accept the divine providence. Ex uh, accept the commandment of the Torah, the advice of the Torah, the directions of the Torah, the directions of the Bible, because this is what we are. This is what we are. We are Israelites. The Torah is an Israelite book. It's given to the Hebrew people, and this is a message for us, expressly for the Israelite nations, and also for all of mankind, and we should heed it. And, uh, and so, this, uh, so any, all attempts to, uh, to express the name of God, the four-lettered name of God, the holy name of God, are doomed to failure, because they do not know where the vowel signs are. And some of these attempts use the vowel signs as found in manuscripts. But these vowel signs in the, found in the manuscripts are deliberately not the ones applying to the letter. Because this is how divine providence wanted it. 
This is how the Bible is written. If you believe in the Bible, you have to believe in the Bible. And you have to take it as it is written. And it's written there for a purpose. This is a message from the God Almighty, from the God of Israel, the God of Israel to the people of Israel, with principles applying to all of humanity. This is divine truth, and it should be believed in. It has to be accepted. And we should search after the truth and not deny the truth wherever we find it. And we should uh, ask God Almighty to guide us and to lead us in the light, to go along the right path and to know the truth and to acknowledge it when we find it. Uh, may the Lord God of Israel bless all of us, bless all the peoples of Israel and be with us always.